conqueror of the known world, propagator of the Hellenistic way of life, undefeated general. Alexander the Great was much more than a brilliant strategist. His coinage and the way he handled the riches of his many conquered peoples transformed the Greek world and its effects rippled for centuries. Today, we will explore the way the coinage of Alexander the Great and his successors affected the lives of the peoples under the con their control and, of course, enjoy their artistic mastery and mysterious messages on the third episode of the Tetradrachma. The year is 323 BC and Alexander the Great is dead. Among his many accomplishments, Alexander ushered an economic boost on the territories under his control that would ensure the hegemony of his successor kingdoms all the way to the ascension of Rome centuries later. The Greeks lived on regions not very adequate for farming or capable of maintaining very large populations. That prompted the many city-states to rely heavily on commerce to trade what they produced in abundance for the many things each polis in inevitably lacked. This resulted in a fairly monetized society which needed a lot of circulating currency to purchase said goods. On the other hand, in an exact opposite of that monetary spectrum, we had the ancient Persian Empire. Although the empire itself was very vast and very rich, the fact is that they used much less money in coin form to move their economy, with the famous siglos and the Dadic being used mostly for external trade and for the payment of armies. As a result, massive treasuries were filled to the brim with precious metals coming from tribute and taxation without any major outflows anywhere. This treasury was systematically seized by Alexander during his campaigns, and the riches of the Persians were immediately coined and sent to Greece, where they ushered a frenzied period of growth. The most important coin used on commerce was the tetadrachm of the Attic standard, established centuries early, earlier in Athens. This coin was a bit over 17 grams, was the main denomination used on international commerce between cities, and the new influx of silver from Persia made their numbers soar. And certainly one of the most iconic tetadrachm were those minted under, under Alexander and on his name after his death. This leads us to the very first coin of the day. This tetadrachm, minted under Seleucus I at around 310 BC, was minted at Babylon, where Alexander is said to have died. On the obverse, we see Hercules wearing the Nemean lion's skin as a headdress. Alexander and Philip II, his father, would feature Hercules on their coinage as, according to myth, propagated by their dynasty, they were distant descendants of Hercules himself. The reverse features Zeus, king of the gods, an only deity that would allow, under his blessing, one man to rule over other men. He's sitting on his throne, holding an eagle and a staff, with the legends that translate to of King Alexander. Lifetime and posthumous tetradrachm of Alexander are surprisingly abundant on the market, and any intermediate collector can, and should, get one of these iconic pieces. Then it was a matter of time until the vast territories conquered by Alexander to splinter into separate factions and independent territories. The Diadochi, or successor kingdoms, were created by the most powerful of Alexander's companions, and each monarch would set up their own dynasties. The largest and arguably most powerful successor kingdom was the so-called Seleucid Empire, named after Seleucus, one of Alexander's generals. It encompassed much of the old Persian territories as well as the, as the easternmost territories. Seleucus' son, Antiochus I, as well as other Seleucid monarchs after him, will do something quite bold for the time. They will actually fe feature their own living images on the coinage of the realm a space previously reserved to deities, icons, and any symbology, but not for a person. On the obverse, we see the bust of Antiochus looking right 
with the headband characteristic of Hellenistic kings. This portrait shows an older Antiochus with a very heavy and tired expression looking upwards, almost as if he was looking for some kind of inspiration or divine intervention. The reverse features the god Apollo, patron deity of the Seleucids, sitting on the Omphalos, a mystical stone said to be placed by Zeus to mark the center of the world. He is holding his bow and inspecting one of his arrows. The legends translate to of King Antiochus, and the monograms indicate that it was minted in the old city of Seleucia on Tigris, close to modern-day Baghdad. On a more respectful tone to tradition, some prefer to have their coinage entirely mythological and iconographic. Demetrios Poliorchites, around the year 30295, minted in the city of Tarsos, this tetradrachma, and instead of showing his own image and attracting glories to himself, he chose instead to show he was a man of action. So much so, he was known as Poliorchites, the besieger. On one side, we can see the prow of a trireme. The triremes were the main war vessel of the ancient world, carrying over 200 men and armed with a bronze beak, called the rostrum, on its front. It was used to ram the enemy ship and pierce it so it would sink to the bottom. We can also see a Nike over the ship, as if guiding it towards victory. The reverse reinforces the idea of superiority over the seas and a belligerent tone. We can see Poseidon advancing to the left, raising his trireme as if he's about to throw it at someone or something. This clearly symbolizes Demetrius wanted to be known as a man of warfare and someone capable of projecting his power by sea throughout the eastern Mediterranean. Next, we head over to, in my opinion, one of the most elegant and timeless ancient coins there are, Lysimachus, one of the closest of Alexander's bodyguards and officers, claimed the region of Thrace for himself after Alexander, and he came up with this jewel. Either as a tribute to his old master, or as a pro propagandistic move to connect himself to the man, Lysimachus decided to add a deified image of Alexander to his tetradrachma. However, he decided to add certain twists to it that gave Alexander certain supernatural connotations. Alexander is depicted with, the ho with horns coming out of his head. These are the horns of Ammon, the Egyptian equivalent of Zeus. As Alexander was conquering Egypt, he claimed to be a descendant of Ammon Zeus, and personally went to the sanctuary of Ammon in Siwa, where his claims were confirmed by the oracle. So according to the, this oracle, only a man directly instructed by the king of the gods would be allowed to conquer such massive and vast territories. So while the obverse is used to give Lysimachus legitimacy through the figure of Alexander, the reverse pays homage to the monarch himself. We see Athena seated, resting with her shield, her spear, and a small Nike with a laurel crown and the legends that translate to of King Lysimachus in good Hellenistic fashion. Athena was the goddess of urban centers, defensive wars, and of the overall idea of the organization of man into a civilization. If you look at some of the modern symbolism on many modern nations, the idea of a female entity symbolizing the state, the union of people, may it be the incarnation of liberty, Helvetia for the Swiss or Britannia for the English, among other national representations, show that the idea has been replicated for millennia on multiple instances and multiple territories. She is often and repeatedly depicted holding a spear and a helmet, one could say as a representation of the projection of power and sovereignty through force of arms of a state, a shield, plaque, or some sort of ornament with some sort of icon or inscription on it, probably as a sign of the values and symbols that are held dear by this nation, and the simple fact a deity that represents cities and states is female, a nurturing and protective gender by nature, probably was intentional. Now how about we head south? The great kingdom of Egypt has always been a major food producing region and generally 
a very wealthy region on ancient times. The first Hellenistic king of Egypt, Ptolemy I, quickly seized the body of Alexander and buried him on his new capital, Alexandria. He did this to gain legitimacy, because according to the Greek tradition, the one true heir to a kingdom was the one who buried the dead monarch. Under the Ptolemies, Egypt had its very first monetary standard, based on the Phoenician system of weights, instead of the Attic system of their northern peers. The denominations were the same, the tetradrachm, the drachm and so on, but of a slightly different, lower weight. Let's take a look at this tetradrachm struck under the years 285 and 246 BC. On the obverse, we can see the bust of Ptolemy I's son, Ptolemy II. As with other Hellenistic kings, we can see him with the distinct royal handband, partially obscured by his noticeably unruly hair. The circular indentation right of Ptolemy's nose is called a countermark. This was a way of revalidating a coin for use. Maybe this means this coin was, has left Egypt at some point, or maybe it was approved by a foreign authority to use. We don't know. Maybe it was revalidated on Egypt itself. Who knows? But it's amazing to see that these little marks sort of like tell the story of the coin. Now, I feature a lot of egos on this channel already. They are a very common sight on Greek or Roman coins for their connections with either Jupiter or Zeus. As the king of all gods, it was believed that only someone with direct authorization by the king of the gods could be a king among men. So why not show your affinity to the king of the gods by showing him or his symbols on your coinage? The reverse features the ego taking most of the space available while resting over a thunderbolt. The legends around the border translate to of King Ptolemy. The successor kingdoms would reign over Alexander's legacy for centuries to come until the final downfall of the Hellenistic powers around the 1st and 2nd centuries BC, but their influence on Western and Eastern cultures would be felt up to the present day. Have you thought about collecting co coins from the Hellenistic kings? What is your favorite of Alexander's hairs? Let us know in the comments. I hope you all have a great holidays and see you all soon.